Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. As Republicans decide what changes to propose to the country's health care system, many are wondering if a version of Indiana's Medicaid program could be arriving soon in other states. That's because the designer of Indiana's Healthy Indiana Plan is the head of Medicare and Medicaid. But some say that system is not perfect. And you've probably heard of a drug-sniffing dog, but what about a dog trained to sniff out electronics? You put a SIM card in the drop ceiling, you know, I mean, even if an officer's searching, he might not find it. We visit a dog being trained to uncover evidence that can be hard to find. Good boy! Plus, some Indiana lawmakers want you to be able to go online to get a prescription for glasses or contacts. We'll tell you why some optometrists say the bill is dangerous. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, the person who designed Indiana's unique Medicaid program may soon be leading national health care policy. Seema Verma is Donald Trump's pick to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And if Medicaid expansion survives efforts to repeal Obamacare, Verma's model, the Healthy Indiana Plan, or HIP 2.0, could spread to other states. About 250,000 people gained coverage under HIP 2.0. But as side effects public media's Jake Harper reports, it's not working for everybody. Seema Verma added a conservative twist to Medicaid expansion. Under HIP 2.0, recipients have to make monthly payments, and a missed payment can mean losing insurance. Now, to be clear, if you make less than the federal poverty level, about $12,000 a year, you don't lose insurance entirely. You get bumped down to HIP Basic, which doesn't cover vision or dental and requires copays. But if you're above the poverty line and you miss a payment, you get locked out of coverage for six months. Critics say the program is too complicated. Fran Quigley runs the Health and Human Rights Clinic at IU's McKinney School of Law. He works with people who have had trouble with their HIP 2.0 coverage. And we're still confused about what they're supposed to do. So absolutely, clients are confused about it. It is enormously confusing. But even if a client does everything right, they pay their bills on time each month, they could still lose coverage because the state and insurers running HIP 2.0 are making mistakes. Alan Wilson drove a semi for 38 years before his health issues forced him into retirement. First, he had heart problems and diabetes. And then a few years ago, he found out his kidneys were failing. A lot of my problems started uh, then. You know, I had to come off the road and, and retire because uh, I, I wasn't able to drive anymore. He signed up for HIP 2.0 in 2015 and paid his bills each month. But he says one time when he went to the doctor, they told him, you're not covered. He says the insurance company, Anthem, told him he missed a payment. Then my wife would find the receipt and say, look, this is when we paid it, this is where we paid it at. But he says this kept happening. Even after repeated calls to Anthem in the state, bills that should have been covered went unpaid. He and his wife were frustrated. Eventually, they got help from an attorney, Catherine Wood works at Indiana Legal Services, a nonprofit that provides free legal help to the poor. I see roughly three to four HIP cases a month. Um, so over the course of a year, I will probably work on anywhere from 35 to 40 HIP cases. Attorneys with ILS say they've appealed and resolved dozens of cases where the state or insurance companies made mistakes that got people kicked off of HIP 2.0. People sent their payments in, but something went wrong. Our clients call us frequently very upset 
and a little bit angry that they have to go through the process of an appeal to get something that they are entitled to that should not have been interrupted. State reports show thousands of people have been kicked off of their HIP coverage for missing a monthly payment. But if a HIP client actually made that payment, they may not know they can appeal or that they can get help through organizations like ILS. Adam Mueller is advocacy director for Indiana Legal Services. In order for somebody to get to us, they need to know that they have a, uh, a, an issue that is a legal issue, and then they need to know they can contact Indiana Legal Services. Um, so I, I would say that we're seeing only a, a, a small portion of what's out there. The state declined to be interviewed for this story, but advocates like Wood and Mueller say these mistakes are inevitable. HIP 2.0 is a huge bureaucracy, a government organization working with insurance companies, managing thousands and thousands of monthly payments. Somewhere along the line, our folks end up slipping through the cracks and um, the payments are, are lost, they're not recognized, and we don't know what happens at that point in time. So it could be a human error, it could be a processing error, we just don't know. Seema Verma and former Governor Mike Pence said monthly payments would get people to engage with their coverage and make more responsible health care decisions. But some health policy experts and attorneys working on HIP 2.0 appeals disagree. They argue the payments reduce enrollment, make the program more costly to run, and more difficult for clients to stay enrolled. So it's exactly the opposite of the small government philosophy. This is just more complicated and more government and more bureaucracy and a huge waste of taxpayer dollars and, and a huge pain and sometimes physically causing pain to people who need help. Without the requirement for monthly payments, people like Alan Wilson wouldn't lose coverage. Wilson eventually got on Medicare, but Anthem still hasn't paid some of the bills he accrued when he should have been covered by HIP 2.0. He says he owes about $3,000, and it makes it stressful to go to the doctor. If Anthem doesn't end up paying, Wilson says he has no choice but to file bankruptcy. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Jake Harper. For more information on state-run Medicaid programs, we spoke with Kosalie Simon, a health policy expert at Indiana University. She says that the Medicaid expansion is likely to undergo significant changes. It looks like this could occur in the form of block granting. And she says there are two big things to know about block granting. One is that the, the way that Medicaid is currently financed, which is non-block grant, is that the federal government tells the states, you sign up as many people as under the rules we have. And for everyone who signs up, I promise the federal government to pay my share of the money. Under a block grant, the federal government says to the state, I'm going to give you a fixed amount of money, and you manage how that's being spent. The concern is, is that fixed amount of money going to be less than what the federal government would have otherwise spent? The second is that states are going to be given more authority to set the rules of how one qualifies for Medicaid, how one continues to, to stay eligible for Medicaid, and what's going to be provided. And so states then may choose a number of different things that we haven't seen currently or have only seen a few states do. And, and the question is, what's going to be the impact of all of those changes happening together? Uh, is there an upside to having a program like HIP 2.0 versus just a regular Medicaid expansion? There are pos possible upsides to allowing states to do things that they see as potentially better for their, for their populations on Medicaid. They may say, well, the federal government designed this program with a one-size-fits-all and, and allows states to have some flexibility, but now we're really expanding, I think, under these new proposals, the scope of what the states could do. It, it's always thought that states would know better how to manage a program, but we, we just need to make sure that it's being done in a way that doesn't cause um, people to fall through the cracks. So the designer of Indiana's Medicaid option is the head of Medicaid and Medicare on the federal level. Do you expect her influence perhaps will make the state's somewhat options resemble HIP 2.0? I think that's what people are saying, that, that many people I hear saying let's look closer at Indiana because things that, that were in Min Indiana's Medicaid plan may be now more um, of what the federal government might see as, as options too. So how would you ex expect uh, Medicaid numbers to be affected by the block grants? I think people's fear are, is that there will be fewer people covered under Medicaid through a block grant system because 
the way that the Medicaid expansions really brought in new people really increased cost as well. If the amounts that are being sent to states for a block grant resemble more what Medicaid costs earlier than, than under the Affordable Care Act, then I think the, the, the implication is that there may be fewer people covered. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. My pleasure, Joe. The bipartisan National Governors Association sent a, le sent a letter to House Republican leaders asking them to retain a meaningful federal role in financing the Medicaid program for low-income people. The group says any GOP replacement should not shift costs to the states. Now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Exodus Refugee Immigration, the organization that battled former Governor Mike Pence's attempted ban on Syrian refugees, says it's deeply troubled by President Donald Trump's plan to do the same across the U.S. Trump intends to stop accepting Syrian refugees and to suspend a broader federal refugee program for 120 days. Pence, now the vice president, tried to ban Syrian refugees from coming to Indiana, citing security concerns. Exodus continued to settle families despite his order. Exodus says Trump's plan comes during one of the worst refugee crises of all time. A former Purdue University student is suing the school and several of its officials for what he calls reverse discrimination in a sexual assault investigation. The unnamed male student says he was suspended and dismissed from the Navy ROTC after he was accused of sexual assault. In a statement, a Purdue University spokesperson says the school is aware of the lawsuit but hasn't been served or reviewed the allegations in, the de in detail. This is the second suit in Indiana claiming the application of Title IX is biased against men. A former Indiana University student is serving one-year probation for attacking a Muslim woman outside Bloomington's Sofra Cafe. Tristan Bickford attacked the woman in October of 2015. Bickford expressed remorse in court and blames the attack on mixing alcohol with prescription drugs. The city of Bloomington says private developers charged with building the section of I-69 from Bloomington to Martinsville won't complete the project until at least August of 2018. The city says contractor Iselux Corson told them of the construction delays during a private meeting, but the state says the city's information is incorrect. We reached out to the state finance authority for an update on the construction and the agency told us completion of Section 5 is scheduled for October of this year. Ball State University is hiring its new president away from Northern Kentucky University. Ball State's trustees voted unanimously to select Jeffrey Mearns as the new president just a year after the Muncie School's previous leader resigned without explanation. The Department of Natural Resources says the non-game wildlife funds donation fell more than 60 percent last year. The culprit was apparently a tax form change that moved a tax checkoff box to another page. Hoosiers preparing their tax returns could check that box to donate tax refund proceeds. Um, so in the past, this money has been used to reintroduce bald eagles into the state and peregrine falcons and ospreys and river otters. The DNR says a code that will be required this year for donations could also impact the fund, which receives no taxpayer funding. And the reward for information leading to a conviction in the fatal shooting of an endangered whooping crane has grown to $15,000. The rare bird was found dead in early January near Goose Pond in southwestern Indiana. Whooping cranes are North America's tallest bird, and there are only about 600 left in North America. Indiana's unemployment rate is at its lowest in more than 15 years. It stands at 4%. But for the fourth consecutive month, the state's labor force declined. The labor force measures people who either have a job or are actively looking for one. Indiana's labor force hasn't shrunk this much in more than four years. A traveling tribute to notable LGBTQ figures is standing in the student union on Indiana University's campus. The Legacy Wall features pictures and biographies of famous artists, musicians, actors, political figures, and social activists. Some people stand there and weep um, because they didn't think they'd ever live long enough to see something like this come into existence. Many people come back four and five times because there's so much content. They want to be able to absorb it all. 
The exhibit can be found in the Indiana Memorial Union through February 3rd. And Joe, this is actually the fourth installation of that wall since it was created in oh, 2015. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We'll visit a dog training to sniff out electronic devices. And there was action this week at the State House on a number of bills. Coming up, a recap. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Tim's. <laughs> There was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail, and the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life. And that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, it's early in the legislative session, but some bills are already gaining traction. Let's review bills making their way through the State House. A bill that would allow counties or municipalities to establish a needle exchange program without getting state approval first is headed to the House floor. The state's new attorney general testified against the proposal, saying expanding the programs would have a detrimental impact on both public health and safety. The state health commissioner and the state director of drug prevention, treatment and enforcement say relaxing the requirements is a much needed step to reduce the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. This session's major road funding bill cleared was approved by the House Roads Committee. The bill includes fuel tax increases and new vehicle registration fees. A fiscally conservative group called Americans for Prosperity Indiana opposed the fuel tax. The group proposes shifting all sales tax on gasoline to pay for roads and freezing all other state spending. GOP Senator Lou Kenley is not a fan. Indiana cannot afford not to do this and do it right because our economy depends on good roads. The town hall was organized by Americans for Prosperity Indiana, a fiscally conservative group that strongly opposes the fuel tax increases in the House GOP road funding plan. AFP Indiana will hold, their, hold other town halls around the state on the issue. An amendment to a bill governing short-term rentals like Airbnb would prevent short-term rentals from operating year-round, capping them at 180 days. The original proposal would have prevented local governments from being able to prohibit or regulate short-term rentals except for when it comes to public health and safety. City officials from East Chicago, Indiana, requested state aid from the General Assembly to combat their lead contamination crisis. The mayor says multiple state and federal agencies have denied requests for more money to clean up the city's Calumet neighborhood. The delegation testified in favor of two bills before the Senate Appropriations Committee. One bill seeks aid for the East Chicago School District. The other seeks $5 million over two years from the state. A bill designed to significantly reduce the, restrict uh, the restrictions on e-liquid manufacturers in Indiana had its first hearing in a Senate committee. Under current law, seven producers control the Indiana market. The restrictions went into effect last year. They prompted a lawsuit from e-liquid manufacturers and sparked an FBI investigation into whether some lawmakers benefited financially from the legislation. All Indiana teachers would have to undergo a criminal background check every five years under a legislative proposal gaining momentum at the State House. The House Education Committee unanimously approved a bill that tightens policies on background checks. A Senate committee approved a bill that would require online retailers to collect sales tax for Indiana, even if they have no physical connection to the state. The bill would require online retailers to collect sales tax if they meet a certain quantity of sales. 
Now, there are questions about the legislation's constitutionality, and a federal court will have to weigh in before Indiana can start enforcing the bill. Some Indiana legislators want Hoosiers to be able to get a glasses or contacts prescription online. As Barbara Brozier reports, a telemedicine bill passed last year prohibits the practice. Several lawmakers are backing a bill that would remove the restrictions on prescribing vision devices through telemedicine. They say the bill is about increasing access for Hoosiers. Well, we all know that we have an access to health care services problem in Indiana. So in some parts, finding a health care provider is difficult in rural areas. Opternative is a service that offers online vision screenings. It allows people to get a glasses or contacts prescription after completing a series of tests using a computer and smartphone. But many optometrists oppose the bill that would make services like Opternative legal. As somebody who's practiced for over 25 years now taking care of tens of thousands of patients, I think of patient after patient after patient that have sat in the chair thinking all they wanted was a pair of glasses or to renew their contact lens prescription and we find something very significant and deal with it. Sutton says optometrists can detect diabetes, high blood pressure, and even tumors during routine exams. Opternative offers its services in 39 states, but pulled out of some, including Indiana, because of legislation. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. South Carolina passed a law banning Opternative from providing prescriptions in the state last year. Now Opternative is suing. We'll continue following these and other bills as the session progresses. Police often use canine units to help with drug and fire investigations, but now some dogs are sniffing out something new. An Indiana man is training them to pick up on the smell of electronic devices like thumb drives and memory cards. As Barbara Brozier reports, a handful of police departments across the country are already using the dogs to help solve cases. This energetic Labrador isn't seeking out treats. Good, see. He's sniffing for evidence. See. see. The dog's name is Chase and he was a rescue dog. Chase is practicing to become an electronic detection canine. Todd Jordan's trained several dogs to aid in fire investigations, but now he's teaching them to sniff out the chemicals used in data storage devices. I had to pay a chemist to actually find, find the actual odor. Um, so it's, it's, it's an odor that's within the actual SD cards, the thumb drives, uh, cell phones. It's an idea Jordan got after talking to a friend who works on the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Investigators can spend days searching for physical evidence in a child pornography case. Jordan thought if he could train dogs to detect the smell of the devices, it could help. Show me. When one of these search warrants take place, there's 20 investigators there and the dog comes in and can cut their time in half or maybe See, within the first 10-15 minutes on, can find um, devices See, that could come back to be great evidence for them. See. And it seems to be working. Jordan's first dog, Bear, helped collect evidence at Jared Fogel's home. The former Subway spokesperson is serving time in prison after pleading guilty to child pornography and sex crimes last year. Cecilia Wiley is a detective with the Internet Crimes Against Children Unit. She says Jordan's dogs have helped quickly track down evidence in several other cases. We go into these houses that are just, a lot of times, just jammed, packed full of stuff, and we're human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss something. Joliet, Illinois is one of several communities benefiting from these special canine units. Communities can purchase them for about $10,000, and they say here it's already paying off. Let's go to work. Joliet received its canine unit named Cash in November, and his handler Megan Brooks admits she was skeptical at first. I took him home for the weekend, and I walked in the door, and I screamed to my daughter, would you please hide your cell phones, because I'm going to come in with the dog, and I want him to search for your cell phone, and she screamed back at me, no mom, I have I can't find my cell phone. I haven't been able to find it for two days. And so we had it in anyway, and uh, he ended up actually finding her cell phone. So. That's when I became a believer. Here's how it works. Come on, seek. Brooks points seek. to an area she wants Cash to sniff seek. out. Seek. And when Cash hits on a scent, seek. He takes two steps Show back me. and sits down. Show me. Brooks asks him Show to me. point to the area where he smells Show the device. Me. Good boy. And he's rewarded with a handful of food. And what we have here on the shelf is a, uh, looks like a composition book, but it's actually a broken iPad. 
Will County State's Attorney Jim Glasgow says he's already getting requests from other agencies who are interested in taking cash out on search warrants. The DEA came and, and asked uh, for a consult, so that doesn't happen. They're not going to waste their time if they think this isn't you know, real science. He anticipates more departments will see the value in purchasing a canine electronic detection unit of their own. So does Jordan who's training his seventh dog for the job. He says they're a tool investigators simply can't duplicate. We can smell a drop of gasoline, um, but to smell a micro SD, I mean, a human can't do that. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. And that's all the time we have for now, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout this week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at MainSourceBank.com Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.